go. Oh, the Holy Rabbi Goldstein is here also. Fonda, welcome. Yeah. Everybody, so nice to see everybody. Yeah. Okay, we should be on Facebook Live also, uh, if anyone needs to go there. Okay, so I'm going to um, I'm going to just give a quick introduction, and uh, then I will uh, mute everybody as we start. Actually, I'll mute everybody now, and then I'll see if anybody wants to say anything afterwards. Okay. So, uh, first of all, a couple of words of introduction. I um, um, want to thank everybody that's all coming to the shir and listening and uh, supporting and trying to spread the Torah of Rabbi Nachman uh, around. Baruch Hashem, we've had a lot of success and we have a lot of people listening and joining up with us. Um, please go to our YouTube channel, Breslov Thornhill, and subscribe and like some videos that you watch there. Um, good news is that we um, have been asked by Rabbi Yossi Katz from the Breslov Research Institute if if we can uh, if we can put this shear onto the BRI website and onto their new app, which is going to be launching tomorrow. Yes, the BRI is launching an app. Pretty amazing. The Breslov Research Institute is launching an app. So this year will be up on uh, on the BRI website and on their app. So go around to the to the YouTube channel and subscribe and like. Check out the BRI, Breslov Research Institute, website and app. And check out our Facebook page and like it there. And why do I always want everybody to, to, to like and to share and subscribe? Because the more people that are socially connected, the more people have the opportunity to hear the life-saving Torah of Rabbi Nachman. The more people get to be lit up and helped. And many of us know that Rabbi Nachman has pulled us out of the depths and given us life when we when we had nothing to, to to hang on to, but we're going to talk a lot about that in this Torah. So please, everybody, let's uh, get get the get the social shares out as much as we can. Thank you so much. Of course, you all know I don't make any money from this, right? This is just for. Uh, uh, I'm not trying to make, tr- trying to deepen my pockets here. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, yeah, what else? The other thing is there's some new people here. So I'll just give a quick rundown of how we run the shear over here. We like to ask people to hold off questions until the end, unless they're absolutely necessary um, for like basic understanding of what's happening. And so if you have a question to ask, there is a way on Zoom that you can um, raise your hand. So you have to each one figure out how to do that. Um, and if it's important, we'll, we'll discuss it. But if not, please keep your questions to the end so we can maintain the flow of the, of the shear for everyone listening on all different formats. And then we'll be happy to stay up all night discussing deep Torahs and ideas that come up in questions with, with tremendous simcha. Um, and that's really it, I think. So um, well, I guess one, one, one more point is that the Torahs of Rabbi Nachman are very deep and very complicated. And it's really important to follow along step by step to build the path that Rabbi Nachman is giving to us. Um, and it's going to take us, this happens to be a little bit of a shorter Torah. It'll probably take us four sessions, I think, four to five sessions. But every step is important. So do your best to, to, to follow along every week and keep, uh, um, uh, uh, as we like to say, hold cup of where we are. Keep, keep an understanding of where we are so we can follow the path and learn the idea that Rabbi Nachman is giving us in depth. Having said that, we always try to make every single class meaningful on its own with, with some of the aspects as well. So we're starting now, Torah Yud. Tur Yud um, was written, was given over just before Purim in uh, 1803. And it happened to be a time when there were a lot of decrees coming out against the Jewish people from the, from the government, from the Russian, Russian government. There was this famous uh, decree that came out called Enactments Concerning the Jews. It was written, written by the Tsar over there. And these were the, all, the, all those terrible decrees that were going to try to wipe Yiddishkeit out completely. And so Rabbi Nachman says, like we're going to see, that uh, Jews have to do what we can to wipe out negative decrees that are coming against us. And the advice of Rabbi Nachman in this Torah is going to be some of that. How do we do that? And we're going to see. And um, 
there's some some very very important stuff here. We're gonna actually um, in this class we're gonna see a little bit in Likutei Halachas and a couple of points from Chaim Aran also, Sichos Aran, just to help to understand some of the basic ideas over here. So let's stop talking about what we're doing <laughs> and let's actually do it. Okay. So the Torah starts like this. It's um, Torah 10 in, uh, in the BRI, Rabbi Chaim Kramer version. It's page 114, and uh, Torah Tess in any other Hebrew version. It starts with a Pasuk, and then a statement, and then we're going to leave those two aside and come back to them at the end of the Torah. The Pasuk that it starts with is from, from uh, Sefer Shmois. Ve'elu ha'mishpatim asher tasim lifneihem. These are the ordinances laws that I have put before you, that you must place before you, actually, that you must place before yourselves. So we're going to come to, back to that Pasuk at the very end. Next, Rabbi, Yad, Rabbi Nachum makes a statement. Now listen to this, and listen to how much this applies to our current situation. Rabbi Nachman says, Kishayesh chas v'shalom dinim al Yisrael When there are, God forbid, divine judgments, against the Jewish people. Al yedei rikudim v'hamcha chaf, through dancing and clapping, nase hamtakas adinim. We effect sweetening of the judgments. So when we're in a situation where there is dinim against the Jewish people, through dancing and clapping of hands, we can mitigate these judgments and Stop whatever's happening, whatever's supposed to be happening. So I'm sure we all understand that there's some aspect of this going on right now. That we're existing in some type of realm where there are dinim. People are dying, people are having their parnasa taken away, people are getting sick, people are facing all kinds of difficulties. This is us experiencing dinim in the world. And when we're experiencing this, we have to know how to get out. And the first statement that Rabbi Nachman says is through dancing and clapping, we can mitigate these judgments. Now, there's an important point that uh, is brought down by a few of the commentaries over here. And that is, we're going to go through this Torah and we're going to see how dancing and clapping of hands are, 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 are deep aspects of Kabbalah. And we're going to understand how it relates to different types of spiritual energies and whatnot. There's going to be depth to it. Very, very, very deep spiritual ideas. Right? But many of the commentaries say that Rabbi Nachman didn't say these things without wanting us, only wanting us to, have, to, re, to, to relate to them on an intellectual level. When Rabbi Nachman said, he said that this is right before Purim, when he wrote this, when he gave over this Torah. And there's decrees against the Jewish people. And the dancing and hand clapping of Purim is going to be what's going to upturn these, these decrees is going to sweeten the judgments. When Rabbi Nachman said that there's an idea that we have to dance and clap our hands, there's deep Torah behind it. But you have to do it. Even if you don't see the rest of the Torah. Even right now, when we finish today, you could stop and turn off the Zoom, or leave it on if you want. <laughs> turn off the Zoom, and give a little dance and cl- uh, clap and sing a, sing a nigan. Right? This is MS, MS, MS. So it's an important idea. The Torah is not meant to be intellectual. The Torah is meant to be something that we live. And especially the Torah of Rabbi Nachman, when the whole point is to give us advice on how to grow and how to connect and how to get through difficult situations. We have to do what the advice is. So we're going to come on to this as we go through. Those are the two introductory statements. Zot Rabbeinu, ki ikar gedulasa yishal HaKadosh Baruch Hu shegam ha'akum yedu sheyesh elokim shalit ha'mayshal. Listen to this. The Iker, the main greatness of Hashem, the essence of God's greatness in the world, is when also non-Jews know that there is Hashem who is ruling and master over the world. And like it says in the Holy Zoyar, until the time when Yisroi, Yisroi, Koyin Midian, the father-in-law of Moshe, came and said, Ki ata yudati, ki gadol Hashem. Now I know that Hashem is great, says the Zoyar. Kadein is yakar v'is alishma ilah. When Yisroi did that, 
Hashem's name had 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 a had a was infused with greatness. His greatness was shown in the world to an extent that it never was before. Everybody knows who Yisro was, right? Yisro was the father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he was known to be the Koyin Midian, the priest of Midian, and he was like the expert in every type of Avodah Zara. If there was an Avodah Zara in the world, he had tried it out, right? And not only did he try it out, he was the expert. And Yisro, basically, if you could have taken one person who was farthest away from the pure essence of godliness and Yiddishkeit, right? That was him. And he came and converted to Judaism and grabbed a hold of the truth. And when he said, now I know that, there's, that, that Hashem is true, at that point, there was never... A, a, a greatening of the name of Hashem in the world. There was never a raising up of the covet of Hashem in the world greater than that point, says the Holy Zoyar. So the idea is like this. When someone comes from far away and comes close to Hashem and shows in the world the greatness of Hashem, that is tremendously huge. And that is tremendously precious to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Hey, Tariq. So, who just said that? You're all supposed to be muted. Okay. So, um, right, thank you. So, um, so like this. Does that only mean that you have to be a priest of Avodah Zarah in order to make this happen? <laughs> right? That's not the message, by the way, in case anyone was wondering. We don't want to go out and become a priest of Avodah Zarah in order so that we can come back. But this concept applies to every single person. Some people are converts to Judaism. Some people are balei tshuva. Some people are, are, were born Jewish, but didn't, didn't grow up religious. Didn't, they weren't connected. Right? For those people, coming from, coming from far away, and then coming close to Yiddishkeit, coming close to Hashem, and bringing Emes out into the world, right? That is a huge, 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 precious item to Hashem. On, a, on an incredible level. Not only that, what if you have someone who grew up religious? Right? There's a, a number of people with us right now who grew up religious. So does that mean that, that they, they can never accomplish this? Every individual person, unless they were born a perfect tzaddik and died a perfect tzaddik, which doesn't happen almost ever, every single person in some way has an ability to come from a low place in their own personal existence and raise themselves up to a high place in connection to Hashem and to, to show themselves and to show Hashem and to show the world the greatness of Hashem in a, in a, in a, in a beautiful way. This is what brings honor to Hashem in the biggest possible way. So we can all do this in, in, in our own specific way and no one should ever think that they can't do it and, that, and then, that there's not a place for them in this realm but remember this should be a tremendous chiyus and chizuk to us all why? because if, you, if we find ourselves in a low place and we are going to this is going to happen to us right? sometimes we're on a high and sometimes we're on a low sometimes we're on an aliyah sometimes we're on a, 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 a yerida and if you're on a, an, an aliyah right now, if you're, do, if you're flying high right now in spirituality, great. Keep it going by remembering to be humble and not to get, uh, not to become a balgaiva, not to get uh, cocky, as they say. Right? Remember that. But if you're, on a, if you're on a low place right now, if you're experiencing difficulty right now, you can break through that difficulty. And some, at some point, you will break through that difficulty. And when you get through there, you are going to be. A, a, like a, a, a pillar of light in the world that brings Elokus into the world, that brings godliness into the world. And everyone can do it. And if we're flying high right now, don't worry. We're going we're gonna to go down again before we come up again. And then we're going to go down again and come up again. And that's what we're supposed to do. That's how we grow. That's how we become close to Hashem. Everybody with me on this? So, let's go weiter. So, it says... And to the non-Jews, They cannot come to know 
the greatness of Hashem, except through the Bechina of Yaakov, the aspect of Yaakov. There's some aspect of Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, our father, that, 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 that there's something about him that non-Jews can only come close to Hashem through him in some way. Let's see what that means. So, like the Pasuk says in Yeshaya, in Yeshaya Beis Yaakov, Lechu, and Elcha, Ba'or Hashem. The house of Yaakov. The house of Yaakov. Lechu, go. Venilcha, and we will go with you. Ba'or Hashem. So, this Pasuk is in Yeshaya, and it's referring to Lasi Lavoy, the, the future, when the base, third base of Mikdash is built. The Goyim are going to say, Jews, Beis Yaakov. Go towards the light of Hashem, and we want to come with you. That's what they're going to say, right? But at that time, the, the, the name that the Navi uses to explain this to us is Beis Yaakov. That's what, they, that's what he calls the Jews at the time, Beis Yaakov. There's something about Beis Yaakov, there's something about Jacob, about Yaakov, or Yaakov Avinu, that that's going to be the, the conduit through which the non-Jews want to come towards Hashem to which the non-Jews know the greatness of Hashem, is through the base Yaakov. Because Yaakov Avinu revealed the greatness of, of, of the Elokus of Hashem, of, of His godliness, of His essence, greater, more so, than the rest of the fathers. How did He do this? How did He do this? Okay, so I'm just going to explain the next paragraph and then we'll come back and understand this in a little bit more depth. Ki Avram Karoi Har. So each one of our, of our, of our avos, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, came to the place of the Beis HaMikdash. And they each gave it a different name. So Avram Avinu came to the place where the Beis HaMikdash is and he called it a har, a mountain. He called it a mountain. Yitzchak Karai Sade. Yitzchak came and he called the place a Sade, a field. So Avram Avinu called it a har, a mountain. Yitzchak called it a Sade, a field. And so Rabbeinu says, Usade, hu yoiser musag v'nitzrach la'oyla mehar. A field is something that is more understood and more needed, more made use of by people in the world. In other words, the difference between Har, mountain, and Sade field is there's more of an intimate connection, there's more of an understanding, and there's more of a need to be involved with field than there is mountain. Right? Because a field is a place where we go and uh, you, know, you grow fruit there, you grow, you grow food produce there, you can, you can graze animals there. People go into a field. Generally, the mountains are places that are far off, that we don't spend as much time in. Yes, we like to go and travel to them and see them because they're unique and unusual. And we don't have, we don't have a deep connection. To, we don't have a, um, a regular intimate connection to them. But a, a field is more has more connection to the regular, everyday workings of a person. Everybody understand that? Okay, but Vayakov, Vayakov Avinu, what did he call the place of the Mesa Mikdash? Vayakov called it a bias. Vayakov called it a house. Shehum makoim yishu adam, yoyser misade. A house is a place for people to dwell in, even more so than a, than, than a field. It's more of an intimate connection. Yaakov called the place of the Beis HaMikdash. And the place of the Beis HaMikdash represents to us the tefillah, prayer, connection to Hashem. He called it bias. He called it a house. That's a place where people live and dwell, where we spend all of our time. So to Avram Avinu, it was mountain. It was far off. To Yitzchak Avinu, it was Sade. It was like a little bit more connected to me, a little bit closer. Ah, oh, but to Avram Avinu, it's my house. It's the place that I live. It's part of me. You hear? This is this is this is Yaakov Avinu's connection to the place of the Beis Hamikdash and to the to the concept of tefillah and prayer. Ki hela es tefillah mehar v'sade lebechinas bias, because he took the concept of tefillah, of prayer. 
and raised it up from mountain and field, which is far off from me, to the place of house. That's a place where I relate to, where I live in. Much more than mountain and field. And, and by the place, when you call something a house, it's so familiar to us and so obvious. And we can relate to it on such a level that even the non-Jews can understand Hashem through Yaakov Avinu. Through Yaakov Avinu's understanding of the Beis Migdash and of the concept of tefillah. Okay, so there's some, that's, that's a, a basic background to start off with over here. Now there's some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Torah over here that, um, that is given over by Reb Nassim and the Kuti Halachas. Um, and I want to read some of it inside because it's so sweet and so special. Very, very, very sweet Torah. So first of all, we have to know that the three fathers, what did they do? They revealed godliness into the world, Right? Elokus, they revealed it into the world. And they each did it in their own way. And they each had a way of revealing God into the world. So therefore, the Gemara tells us that Avram Avinu was Mesake in Tefillah Shachris. Avram Avinu established the, the prayer, the morning prayer. Yitzchak Avinu was Mesake in Tefillah Mincha. Yitzchak established the afternoon prayer. The Yaakov Avinu was Mesake in Tefillah Arvis. He, he established the nighttime prayer. And Prayer in the world is really the biggest revelation of Elokus in the world. And anyone who's been to the last few Torahs that we learned, how do we see this? What's a beautiful way that we see this? We know that Rabbeinu told us that the concept of Emuna, Nisim, and Tefillah, and also Eretz Yisrael, are all one thing. You guys remember this? Give me a, put your hand up if you remember this. Yeah, very good. Very, very good. So, why is that so important? Because it's through these concepts that the world gets filled with emuna. Right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna use some, some Rav Arush language now. Right? <laughs> we need to fill the world with emuna. We need that everyone understands the existence of Hashem in the world, and everyone relates to the concept of emuna in the world. And emuna and tefillah and Nisim, Emunah, faith, Tefillah, prayer, and Nisim, miracles, are all one thing. And how do we see that? We see that because we know that what's the essence of a nace? What's a miracle? A nace is, a, a miracle is when we have nature following its regular natural path. And a nace means that Hashem changes nature, subverts nature, turns it on its, on its bottom, and makes a new thing happen. That's what a nace is. When we go out from the natural order of things, a nace. And we have emuna that Hashem can make nisim. And that's why we daven. In other words, they're all three connected. We daven to Hashem and we ask Him for things because we believe that He can do it. Even though the way my life is going right now, you have a person, say you have a person who hasn't had a job for a long time, who hasn't had gotten married for a long time, who hasn't had children for a long time, whatever it is, and the doctors are saying it's not going to happen, or the career counselors are saying, Ugh, you're, a tough, <laughs> you're a tough guy to find a job for, right? Or whatever the situation is. It, does, it looks like according to nature, it's not going to happen, but the person davens and they break through the heavens for as long as it takes, and then the job comes. And then the shidduch comes, and the children come, and nature is subverted because this person had a muna and prayed and made that connection, and everything was changed. So through prayer, a muna is revealed in the world, and elokus, godliness, is revealed in the world. This is what we want. We want for everybody in the world that we should all have a muna. And when everybody in the world has a muna, everybody will live a different life. Everybody will be able to, to, to face difficulties with a whole different perspective. Right? It's a gift to the world, emuna. So, each one of our forefathers who revealed one of these aspects of prayer, Shachris, Mincha, and Mariv, they revealed godliness into the world through tefillah. But there's a difference between Shachris, Mincha, and Mariv. There's a difference between the morning prayer, the afternoon prayer, and the evening prayer. What does the morning prayer mean? The more, what happens in the morning? Right? Oh, the sun comes out. And it's the crack of dawn. And you wake up. And you're fresh. And the light is in the world again. 
right? And it's a new day, right? This is the day, the, the day that Hashem made for me. It's a beautiful new day. So we have a whole, you wake up in the morning, and everybody knows, like in regular uh, English we say, you wake up in the morning fresh as a daisy, clear as morning, right? It's clarity. Morning is clarity. Morning is, 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 is a time of newness and clarity. So the prayer of Shacharis has that, ca- that character to it. As we go through the day, and we approach the time for the afternoon prayer, closer to sundown, so the sun starts to, I don't know, wax or wane, whichever one is correct. <laughs> the sun starts to, uh, you know, get less <laughs> uh, as, it, as it's going. And we're getting farther away from that morning clarity. Some of our, of our, of our intellectual faculties and our spiritually intellectual faculties are, are leaving us. And we daven that, that tefillah of, of mincha at that time. Oh, but then there's the tefillah of, Ar- of Arvis, of Mairiv. That's the tefillah that we say in the dark. In the dark. So the, the, the holy Reb Nosan says in the Kuti Alachas, this beautiful idea that Yaakov Avinu made this prayer. Specifically, Yaakov Avinu made this prayer. Yaakov Avinu, who had the hardest life of all of those three fathers, he spent years working for Lavan, and, and he got the wrong wife, and then he tricked him, and then he got the other one, and then he had to work extra years, and then he came out of there, and then his sons were fighting, and his son Yosef was, he, he thought, was mutilated by an animal, and he was away from his son for 22 years, and that whole time he, the, he lost the power of prophecy because he was so broken. And you can't have prophecy without Simcha. And he was mamish broken. He had no prophecy. And he had to, before that, he had to fight with his brother, right? Remember? There's so many things. Yaakov's, Yaakov's life was, was mavak after mavak, was fight after fight. He had a very, very difficult life. And he was the one who at that point, knowing what his children were going to go through, was Masakin the tefillah of Mairiv, the prayer of the nighttime. Right? The famous thing, beautiful idea, says by the, by the end of Yaakov Avinu's life, that Yaakov, Ratzah Ratza Yaakov, the Galias Akates, he wanted to reveal the end, what was going to happen at the end of times to all his children, to the 12 tribes. He wanted to tell them, here's what's going to happen in the end times, like Mashiach times, so everyone should be ready. And, and so at that point, the, the, the Mepharshim say that his prophecy was taken away from him and he was not able to tell them what to do. There's a beautiful Devartari that he really did tell them what to do based on the, on the Pasuk, but that's not for now. But this was Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu saw that there's going to be Averas in the future and there's going to be Gullis and it's going to be difficult and there's going to be dark times and Yaakov Avinu stood up right then and said, I have to be Masakein Mairev. I have to tell the Jewish people, I have to connect everybody to prayer in a place of darkness. That even when we're at our lowest, even when we're facing very serious challenges, we have, we have something to hang on to. And Yaakov Avinu is our anchor. He's the one who first laid that down for us. And we're going to see how, 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 how after Yaakov Avinu, Later tzaddikim are our anchor afterwards. But this is the main idea. So it's from that dark place, from that place of gullus, from that place of difficulty, where we all find ourselves at some point. And at that place, at that point, is when we need something to connect to. So says Reb Nassim, that this is what it means, that the rest of the nations are going to only know Hashem and know tefillah through Beis Yaakov. Because it's that place where we all need to connect to, where we can all identify with, where I have a very serious difficulty and I need to reach out. At that place, it, people are able to be connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's what Yaakov Avinu gave us. And that's why Beis Yaakov is the place of connection for everybody. Everybody with me on that? It's pretty gorgeous, right? Totally amazing. Totally beautiful. Okay, let's go weiter. So he said, 
כי בחינס בייס, בייס, יש גם לקום, הסגה, כמו של כסף. So, and, and how do we see that the concept of bias, of house, which is, which is the aspect of Yaakov, how do we see from Pesukim now? We now have talked about how we understand how people connect to it, but where do we see in Pesukim that, that the whole world connects to the name Beis Yaakov, bias, connects to the concept of bias through tefillah? Because the Pesukim Yeshaya says, Ki Beisi, Beis Tefillah, Yikare, Lechol Ha'amim. My house, Hashem says, my house, is called a house of prayer for all nations. It doesn't say my mountain is a mountain of prayer for all nations. It doesn't say my field is a field of prayer for all nations. It says my house. Bias. My house is a place of prayer for all nations. And that's, of course, we say that in Davening on the Yom Narayim. Right? And when a person can relate to Hashem and can, can, can relate to tefillah in the same way that they relate to a house, then there's a tremendous greatening of the name of Hashem. A tremendous greatening of the name of Hashem. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, v'zei perish, let's go weiter. V'zei perish, and this is what the Pasuk means in Tehillim. Gadol Hashem, umahula me'oid. Hashem is great and tremendously praised. Mahulal praised me'oid, a lot, right? Klemar, emas I got Hashem, meaning what? How do we understand this? When is Hashem great? At what point, at, in what aspect is Hashem great? Kishahu mahulal me'oid, when he is tremendously praised, misitra de moisa, from the side of death. Stick with me, make sure we understand the whole, everything that's going to happen over here. Try and, tr- try and follow along with this. This is going to be awesome. When is Hashem praised? Gadol Hashem, umahula me'oid. Hashem is great and praised a lot. When is Hashem great? Keshehu mahula me'oid. When He is praised greatly from the side of death. What does that mean? How do we see this? Misitra de Moisa. Shubichinas akum. That's relating to the other nations of the world. Like Chazal say in Bereshis Rabbah al Pasuk, the Pasuk says in Bereshis at the very beginning, the Hine Toiv Meoid. So in all the days of creation, Hashem made something and then he said, Vayar El Kim Ki Toiv, right? But there's one time, actually two, two times, but anyway, where he says, Vihine Toiv Meoid. And behold, it was Toiv Meoid. It was, I think uh, often it's translated as exceedingly good, right? Toiv Meoid. It was very good. What does Toiv Me'od mean? The Medrash Rabbah says, Toiv Me'od, Ze Malach HaMavis. That's referring to the angel of death. What is really good? The angel of death. Kishahu Mahula Mehem. And when Hashem is praised by that side, by the Malach HaMavis, Azai Hu Gadol. Because that's the greatness of Hashem when He's praised from something that seems to be very far away on the other side. So this is a little bit hard to understand. Um, there's a beautiful explanation about this by um, I think maybe the Bir the Kutim. Yeah, it says like this. Listen to this. How do we understand this? So he says. It says this in Bereshit Rabbah. Am Rabbi Yishmol Bar Yitzchak. Hinei Toiv Me'od Zeh Malach Chaim. Toiv Me'od, that's referring to the Malach Malach Chaim, the angel of life. Vehinei Toiv Me'od Zeh Malach Amavis. And behold, very good, that's referring to the Malach Amavis, says the, the Medrash. Vehi Malach Amavis Toiv Me'od? How could it be? Asks the Medrash. How could you say the Malach HaMavis is Toiv Me'oid? That doesn't make sense. So he explains like this. Ella, la Melech Shas So it's a mashal to a king who makes a Suda. He makes a big gathering, a big meal. And he invites all his guests to come and sit at the table and puts out the most amazing spread of food that you could possibly imagine. At like everything, the best of the best. Whatever your favorite food is, Made by uh, Gordon Ramsay, I don't know, right? <laughs> the best of the best, possibly the best you can imagine. Is he still a famous person? Yeah. Okay. 
So, so anyway, the, the most amazing food you can imagine and the best wine, right, from Bordeaux, right? Maybe in, from, from, from Italy, from France, you know, the best of the best is at the Suda. Amar, kol shehu oichel mavarech hasamelech, and he said, everyone who eats and blesses the king, anyone who eats and blesses the king, yeichel v'yerav loy, he eats and, and it's pleasing to him, that's great, amazing. He can eat as much as he wants. Stay all day, all night, and enjoy. But anyone who eats and doesn't 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 make a blessing or doesn't thank the thank the the king who made the suda. He's going to off with his head with a sword. Right? So too, a person who comes into this world and does mitzvahs and ma'azim toivim, he's going to be face to face with the Malach Chaim, the angel of life. He's going to face the Malach Hamavis. So, how do we take this story and understand it in a, in a, in a way that's going to make sense to us? So, I think it's like this. Um, we know... How, so in other words, how can we call the Malach HaMavis Toiv Ma'ed? Right? Yeah, I, I, th- I think we, can, we, we have a way to look at it. So we can say it like this. What are we doing here? Why, do we, why are we alive? Why did Hashem create the world? What's the purpose of us being here? Right? All we, we, there is a purpose of us being here. The purpose of us being here is that we should come to know Hashem, like the Zoyar says, and that we should have devakis with Hashem, right? And that we should, like Chassidah says, make a dira betach make a dwelling place for Hashem in this world. In other words, there is a purpose to this world. And the purpose of this world is us, however you want to say it, they all really mean the same thing, is for us to connect to the light of Hashem and bring it into this world and to, to absolutely cling to it and to leave the vain aspects of the world aside to leave materialism aside, to leave sheker and falsehood aside, and to connect to Hashem's, to Hashem's light, right? To the Or Ein to connect to it on a deep level and bring it into this world. That's our purpose. And if we're not fulfilling that purpose, what are we doing? I'll remind everybody of a famous, um, I think it's a Gemara, a famous Gemara, where there's a, a difference of opinion between Beis Shama and Beis Hillel. That is it, is, it, is it good that we were created or not? Should we have been created or not? Everybody know this? Everybody heard this before? So, it's much like it's a big argument, and it comes out that uh, Beis Shammai says it's better we shouldn't be created. Better that we weren't created. Because what happens? Our soul comes tachas kisei akavoid. Our soul is hewn from underneath the throne of Hashem and is brought down into this world. Better it should have stayed there, underneath the throne of Hashem. Then it's going to come down into this world and we're going to destroy it. We're going to make it dirty and sully it and it's not going to be able to go back to that same place. Right? And Hillel said no. Actually, Hillel didn't say no. Hillel said, you know what, you're right. But now that we're here, we have to do tshuva and we have to do mitzvahs and maizim toivim and by doing that, we can get back up to that place and higher. So, in other words, if we're not using this world as an opportunity to get close to Hashem, if we're not using our time as a way to fix the world, to bring Elokus into the world, if we're not using our time as a way to make a dirabatach toidim, a dwelling place for Hashem in this world, to bring light into the world, and we're just going to movies, and we're just watching TV and doing whatever else people do. If we're just wasting our time, then you're right, it's better we weren't created. And then the Malachim Abbas is a good thing because that person who's wasting their life needs to start again and needs another chance. We need to be, wakened, we need to be woken up and to show that we have a job to do and we can, we can bring tremendous light into the world. Right? So... The Malach Chaim, if we're, if, we're, if we're bringing Hashem into the world, the Malach Chaim is our best friend. But if we're not, 
The Malach Mavis is going to nudge us. Hey, the Sitra Achra is going to nudge us. The Yetzirah is going to nudge us. And is going to try to get us back on track. Going to give us wake-up calls. And that is Toiv Ma'oid. That is tremendously good. Right? We need wake-up calls sometimes. Right? I'll give you one example before I... And then I'll close my mouth a little bit and get back into Rabbi Nachman. <laughs> but um, imagine... I know a few people who deal with a situation kind of like this. Imagine you have a person who has a problem with, let's say, drug abuse. Right? So what's the right thing to do for that person? Say you're a parent of such a person. Do you keep giving them money and allowing them to go out every night and associate with whoever they want to associate with? Right? And they come back to you and they, with tears in their eyes, please, 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 I need the money, please, please help me, don't you love me? Right? And sometimes it's pulling out a person's heartstrings and they got to give them, they give them more money, but giving them more money, just what, what, what's it called in pop psych talk? You're, called, you're, an, you're an enabler. You're just enabling them to go further and further down, to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Right? So sometimes that person needs to experience a difficulty, a challenge, needs to hit some type of bottom in order to be woken up. Chas v'shalom, we should not try to judge uh, anybody, and we should not try to determine when we think someone should, should hit bottom, that's not up to us, right? But sometimes they need to hit that bottom in order to wake up and not continue to waste their lives and not continue to go down and down and down, right? So too, this is our lives. This is what, this is, this is what our lives are all about. If we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, sometimes the Yitzhahara, the Satan, Hashem, needs to wake us up and say, hey, 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 I can't keep enabling you. You got to wake up and you got to do what you need to do. And that's what happens. So that's why it's Toiv Ma'id. I hope that, uh, that clarifies it a little bit because it's a bit hard to understand. You ready with me on that? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah? All right. Okay, let's go. <laughs> well, uh, we're just about finished here. Yeah. And when is it, at what point is it considered that Hashem is tremendously praised from those negative sides? The rest of that Pasuk is, the Pasuk says, Great is Hashem and tremendously praised in the city of God, the mount, mountain of His Holiness. When is it that Hashem is praised? When is Hashem's name great? When the aspect of har, of mountain, when that aspect of Hashem being at a distance becomes like ir elokeinu, becomes like the city of God. When we go from, being, from viewing Hashem as a far off mountain, from when we go from there into the place of being in the city of God. When we go from that place of distance to that place of intimacy. Right? Bechinas bias, which is the same thing as house. Shu musag yoyser mehar vasadeh, which is a place that, that is more connected to us. We understand more and we exist with more than, 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 than mountain and field. Tainu, kishamalim es bechinas atafila, me bechinas har. When we raise up the concept of tefillah, of prayer, from mountain and field, which is when Hashem is far away from us, to the aspect of city and house, which is when Hashem is close with us, when we connect to Hashem on a close level. And at that point, even non-Jews who are not connected to, to, to tefillah at all, can connect in that way, can understand and feel and be part of this aspect of tefillah. Az daika gadol Hashem. That is when Hashem is great, says Rabbi Nachman. Because that's the main greatness of Hashem. When even those who are far away know about Hashem, that is the greatness of Hashem. Wow. Okay, tiny bit more. We usually do an hour, so we'll uh, we'll go a little bit more. The Indians, 
We're going to get something important now. And this aspect that we're talking about, that we have to raise up this aspect of prayer from mountain and field to city and house. Like the city of God. In order so that we can reveal the kingdom of Hashem, the kingship of Hashem, also to the non Jews. That they should also have a connection and an, a, the ability to understand and attain the godliness of Hashem, of His name. It's not possible to do this except for, I bet you could all guess what the next words are going to be. The only way that this can happen is through Tzadike Hador. Is through the tzaddikim of the generations. The only way we can bring this down into this tangible, experiential connection to Hashem is through the tzaddikim. So the, the Gemara says in Baba Basra, anyone who has a sick person in his house. He should go to a chacham, to a wise person, to a tzaddik, and ask that that person should daven for them. Isn't this, hasn't this been the, the behavior, the general minig, the custom of Jewish people throughout the millennia? That when, the Gemara speaks about it all the time, that when there's, when there's someone sick in the house, when you have someone who's in danger, what do we do? Do we give up? Chas v'shalom. Ein shum yehosh. But we, t- we go to the chacham, we go to the tzaddik, and we ask that tzaddik to daven for them. Right? There's a famous story in the Gemara that the son of, of um, Rabbi Gamliel, I think, was sick. So he sent his two students to go to Rabbi Chanina ben Doisa. Rabbi Chinnah ben Dois, even though Rabbi Gamliel was the Nasi Hador, he was the Nasi, he was like the prince, he was like the political and religious leader of the Jewish people. Ah, but Rabbi Chinnah ben Dois uh, was like the Tzaddik. He was the holy, holy, holy person. It says about Rabbi Chinnah ben Dois uh, that, that, that if there was a drought and they needed rain, that the, the custom was, I mean the custom is, and was, that, they, that we would fast and pray to make it rain, right? So the Gemara says that when Rav Chaniyah Mendoza, all he did was take off his shoe, because they would, they would take off their shoes and put on sackcloth, right? He took off his shoe, and the second that his foot hit the ground, the rain started to fall. That was enough. Because Rav Chaniyah Mendoza was the amazing, sweet, unbelievable tzaddik, right? So Rav Chaniyah Gamliel, when his son was sick, he didn't daven, for him, he sent his two best students to go to Rabbi Chinnah Mendoza. Rabbi Chinnah Mendoza saw them coming through his window. The Gemara says the story. And, and by the time they got to the door, Rabbi Chinnah Mendoza opened the door and he said to them, I know why you're here and don't worry, Rabbi Gamliel's son is already healed. Right? Because he was such a holy, beautiful, sweet, amazing tzaddik. So, so why, why are we saying this over here? Because we see, this is, this is where we go to connect to tefillah on a deep level. We go to the tzaddikim. And um, I wanna, I'm going to end it here, but I want to say um, something that I'm sure we all feel on a very, very, very deep level. And that is that we've been talking about right now the beginning of this beautiful Torah from Rabbi Nachman, sweet, beautiful Torah, right? We're talking about this idea that when we find ourselves in nighttime, we find ourselves in gullus, we find ourselves in darkness, in our own personal exile. And uh, right now we're in a middle of a, a, a the, the middle of a worldwide national exile as well. And when we find ourselves in our own personal exile, and things are difficult, right? The, the Rabbi Nachman is telling us the answer is to connect with Hashem, to Hashem with tefillah on a very intimate level in this way of bias where, 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 where Hashem's not far away from us. Hashem is right here. Just like I live in my house, I live with Hashem. I live with tefillah. 
And the only way to do that, says Rabbi Nachman, is through connecting to the tzaddikim hador, is through connecting to the tzaddikim. I cannot imagine existing without the Torah of Rabbi Nachman. The tzaddik, the tzaddikim, the tzaddik hador, the tzaddik esayd olam, all the tzaddikim, all the Torah, all the where we could, I couldn't get through this. I couldn't get through life without Rabbi Nachman, without the tzaddikim. Every Torah that we learn, everything that lights us up, right? That takes a take, takes a, a little candle and puts it inside our neshama and gives us chiyus, gives us strength. Every time we connect to the tzaddikim when we daven. Right? Every time we hear words of encouragement and words of Torah and everything we gather from the tzaddikim, this is how we do it. It's so clear and obvious. Right? So Rabbi Nachman is telling us, if we want to be those people who are connected on an intimate level and who are, who, 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 we don't think Hashem is on a mountain. Hashem is in my house with me. I'm in His house. We are together. I made a house for Hashem in my heart. Right? If we want to be those people, we need the tzaddikim, and Baruch Hashem, we have the Torah of Rabbi Nachman, and of all the tzaddikim, we should merit, God willing, to go on through this Torah. Like I said, I think it'll take us maybe four weeks, something like that. And to hear these beautiful words, we're going to hear Torah about dancing and clapping hands. We're going to hear some Kabbalah. We're going to get deeper and deeper into this idea, and I look forward to seeing everybody next week.